Thanks, Ella. Um, yeah, please uh, do keep that passage open. That's where we're going to be spending our time this morning. Um, let me pray as we come to God's word together. Our Father God, we, we are so thankful for all that you have done for us in your son. Uh, we thank you that you call us together to be your people. We thank you that you are renewing us each day by your spirit. And Lord, we pray that as we consider this uh, passage and this outpouring of praise, uh, that that would be uh, encouraging and shaping us today. Amen. Well, friends, if you've been with us this term, uh, we've been uh, exploring all kinds of different ways that we can be on mission together. Uh, how there's many different activities uh, through which we can be, we can all be involved in promoting the gospel. So some of the things we've thought about, uh, we've thought about uh, proclaiming the gospel, uh, praying for the gospel, uh, living out the gospel, uh, supporting gospel work financially. Uh, we've thought about the role of evangelists in the church. Um, and today as we come to the end of this series, uh, well, the final gospel promoting activity to consider is what John Dixon refers to as our public praise. And that is the gospel witness that it is when we gather together in public meetings just like this. Um, now, uh, as Rod's been with us, we've just held some focus groups over this weekend to think about the contribution of each of our Sunday services. And I want to say thanks to all of you who participated in those um, and also all of you who um, uh, gave feedback and responses through the surveys as well. Uh, and so that helps us as we think about our public praise. And this is what we're thinking about today, how our regular gathering together each Sunday is a gospel promoting activity. Now you might think, how is that the case? Uh, how does a meeting of, well, mostly Christians uh, gathering together each week, how does that promote the gospel? Well, listen to this paragraph from John Dixon. He says, uh, my point is the Bible accords a significant place to the normal gathering of God's people as a means of declaring God's truth to the world. Uh, he says, research by sociology professor Rodney Stark shows that one of the key reasons evangelical churches grow is that their members simply invite their neighbours to church. So how are our Sunday gatherings a gospel promoting activity? Well, it's because the expectation in the New Testament is that as God's people gather each week, well, the gathering will be mostly Christians. Um, that means there will be those coming along, gathering with us, who are not Christian yet. Uh, there'll be some who have been invite, invited, uh, some who just wander in. And uh, what believers, what we do in our, our normal meetings each Sunday is an amazing opportunity for those who are interested or curious about Christianity to take a look. Uh, one place where we see this is uh, in 1 Corinthians 14 um, in the New Testament. Let me just read a couple of verses from there. What's on the screen? Uh, Paul says, so if the whole church comes together and uh, everyone speaks in tongues and inquiries or unbelievers come in, will they not say you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now the context here is that Paul is addressing the church in Corinth and how they should use their spiritual gifts in a way that is loving and edifying for all. And uh, prophesying there really just means intelligible speech. Uh, I think maybe that didn't come through very clearly in the survey. Um, but uh, notice here that um, as the church gathers together to use its gifts, it does that particularly with a view to inquirers or unbelievers being present. Now, it's not that the whole thing is pitched at non-Christians. Uh, the primary purpose is for uh, believers to gather together and to be encouraged in our faith. But everything uh, should be done in a way that is intelligible and understandable so that anyone who comes in uh, might hear what is being said, um, hear what is being sung, listen to the prayers, uh, watch and experience the community. And that is enough, says Paul, to convince a visitor to worship God. 
Um, the point is, uh, what we do here each Sunday is a powerful promotion of the gospel. Now, there's lots of uh, places in the Bible where we could go to dig a little bit deeper into that, um, uh, because there's lots of times where we see in the Bible God's people gathered together in praise of him. Um, but the passage that I thought we could look at today, uh, where we just one example of God's people gathered together declaring his praise is in 1 Chronicles 16. So if you've got that in front of you, uh, it'd be great to look at that chapter. And really just to ask here, well, what is it that an onlooker might see and experience in the regular gathering of God's people? Um, what, what is it that might uh, cause them uh, or cause that response, like what we see in 1 Corinthians 14, where they come to worship God and exclaim, God is really among you. And I think from this gathering here in 1 Chronicles 16, I think there's three clear things that a visitor or inquirer would see and experience. So these will be our three points today. First, there is declaration. Uh, there's a declaration of who God is, of his goodness and grace. Second, there is worship. Um, that is, there are God's people ascribing to him the glory due his name. And third, there is joy. There is rejoicing in God the Saviour. So declaration, worship and joy. Now, if you look in uh, 1 Chronicles 16 here, this is a chapter describing an occasion in Israel's history when they are gathered together in worship. Um, and I realise that the book of Chronicles is, you know, maybe not where your Bible naturally opens to. Uh, so just to mention a couple of things about it, First and Second Chronicles, are, they're actually the last books um, to be written in the Old Testament. Uh, you, you don't kind of immediately pick that up because it's right in the middle of our English Bibles. But um, in the Hebrew version of the Bible, Chronicles actually ends uh, the Old Testament and that much better reflects the time that it was written. And most likely it's written by Ezra the priest. And uh, he's writing at a time when Israel have uh, returned to their land after they'd been exiled to Babylon for 70 years. And so Israel, they've, they've come back to their homeland, but at this stage in their history, they are really a, a fairly small and powerless group. Um, there's no king in Israel. Um, they're under the rule of a foreign nation. Um, the temple has been rebuilt, but it's not very impressive. And so the feeling for God's people at this time is that things just aren't going that well for them. Uh, probably their gatherings in the temple don't feel that special. Uh, and they might wonder, is God even among them? But this is why Ezra writes this book. And what, what he is doing is he's retelling and reflecting on how God has acted in Israel's past in order to encourage them and spur them on in the present. And in this chapter here, Ezra describes this great gathering of God's people which took place in the time of King David, when, as you see there in verse 1, uh, the time when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem. And what that led to was this outpouring of praise to God. And the reason Ezra writes about this great event in Israel's history is to remind people in his day of who their God is and of his great grace and his faithfulness that he has shown towards his people. And so we see how he describes this scene. Um, the Ark of the Covenant is brought into Jerusalem and then in response to that, it says uh, from verse 7, we see that David appoints Asaph and his associates to give praise to the Lord in this manner. And what follows there from verse 8 through to where we uh, read earlier is that we're given this great psalm of praise to God. Um, and actually, it's, it's actually more than one psalm. Um, it's, this section here is kind of a mashup of a few different psalms. Uh, kind of Israel's greatest hits all put together. Um, Asaph has pulled together probably parts from three different psalms. So um, uh, it begins with uh, verses from Psalm 105. So in Chronicles 16, that's verses 8 to 22. And then from verses 23 to 20 uh, to 30, uh, that's Psalm 96. And then the last three verses are verses from Psalm 105 oh sorry 106 um, so it's kind of this pulling these great psalms together and into one great psalm of praise one declaration of praise and uh, it seems that the people of Israel enjoy it uh, finishes then all the people said amen 
and praise the Lord. So um, Asaph, on this occasion, he pulls together these great psalms of praise and worship, combines them to lead God's people in praise. And so as they do that, as they recite those psalms, as they sing them, well, firstly, what is it that they declare? Well, the main thing that they declare, the main theme, is the greatness of God and his grace toward his people. Uh, they declare in verse 9, uh, his wonderful acts. They declare in verse 12, the wonders he has done. Uh, they declare then a kind of a longer section describing his faithful love. Verse 15, remem- uh, that he remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made to a thousand generations. And notice that they declare these things about God, these truths about God, they do it with a view to the outsider. So right from the very beginning, verse 8 says, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. See, the nations are on view right from the start, but if you jump down to verse 23, uh, this is where Psalm 96 begins, uh, we see now that the nations are directly uh, are addressed directly. So verse 23, sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. Why are they to do that? Well, verse 25, for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Now, maybe that's uh, ringing some bells, reminding us of how we started this series, because do you remember we started this series by looking at Psalm 96 together? And we saw that this is actually, Psalm 96 is actually the most important text in the Bible on the topic of mission. And the reason why is because it tells us that there is only one God and that all people are to give praise to him. Uh, And this is the premise that John Dixon gave us that underlines the driving motivation for all of our mission. Uh, This is what he calls the fundamental mission equation. He said, if there is one Lord to whom all people belong and owe their allegiance, well, the people of that Lord must promote this reality everywhere. And this is what Psalm 96 declares. This is what we hear from verse 26. uh, For all of the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place and so that means that the nations the outsiders those who are far off are invited to come in and to worship the God of Israel verse 28 ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations ascribe to the Lord glory and strength ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name bring an offering and come before him worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness you can imagine Ezra uh, in his day as he recounts this story to the people gathered in the temple. Now, they're a small group. Uh, they're surrounded by other nations who are worshipping other gods. But as they gather here to worship and to declare God's grace and faithfulness, they, they do it with a view to the nations around them, that they too would hear this truth about God being declared and that they would come and join with Israel in giving praise to the one true God. And then it's not surprising that we see the same dynamic happening when we come to the New Testament. So we just read in 1 Peter. Uh, Peter writes to the uh, small struggling churches across Asia Minor, those as well who are surrounded by a pagan culture, a world that's becoming more hostile to Christianity. Well, Peter reminds them of who they are. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So Peter's speaking there about their public gatherings. It is that they've now been chosen in Christ, become his new people. Well, they are now to declare his praises. And so what David began at the arrival of the ark in Jerusalem, uh, what Ezra did in the temple, what Peter encourages the churches to do, well, we now continue in our gatherings through our 
readings, our speaking, our singing, uh, we declare the praises of the one true Lord who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And so this is the first thing going on uh, in the public gathering of God's people that uh, a visitor or inquirer would see and experience, a, a declaration, a declaration of who God is and his goodness and his grace. And I hope that's true of us here at St Aidan's in, uh, as we gather to sing, as we read the Bible, uh, as we have the Bible explained. Um, every Sunday is a time when God's grace and goodness can be declared. Uh, but two other things that people will see, um, and we'll do these a little bit quicker. The second is worship. Um, now, what is worship? Sometimes people think of worship as just the singing, that that's the worship time. Now, worship certainly includes singing, but uh, that's far too narrow a definition of what worship is. Um, instead, to use the words of the psalm here in verse 29, uh, worship is to ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Uh, in the Bible, what worship is, is it's the act of ascribing ultimate value to something in such a way that it captures and engages your whole life. So it's not just an intellectual thing. I mean, it does, of course, involve our reasoning and our thinking. Um, in verse 12, we are to remember the wonders he has done. We've already thought about declaring the truth about who God is. Uh, but remembering and reflecting on the truth about God and his grace then affects our whole life. It affects our emotions. So verse 9, we are to sing to him, sing praise to him. And it affects our, our will, it affects how we live. Verse 10, glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Worship affects every aspect of who we are, our mind, our emotions, our will. And so what is it that engages and affects our entire life in that way? Well, it is when we assign greatest value to something. It's when we treat something in our lives as the most important thing. Um, so we say the word worship, but the old way of saying it was worth-ship. Uh, so worship begins with seeing what something is worth. It's a bit like if, you, uh, you know, if you've seen that show Antiques Roadshow, or you know, there's lots of kind of shows like that where someone, you know, they might bring in that dusty old painting it's been sitting in the shed and they, they bring it in to the expert appraiser and uh, the appraiser begins to look over it to see what it's worth. And sometimes on that show, you know, they have these amazing finds. Uh, and so the appraiser begins to look at it closely and he inspects it and he starts to get a bit excited. You know, he realises how old it is how rare it is, he sees who the artist is. And eventually he stands back and, and marvels because he recognises what it's worth. And now that the owner knows what it's worth, well, their entire life changes. You know, the way they treat that painting changes. They don't leave it in the back of the shed. And why? Well, the reason is because they have recognised what it is worth. And worship is like that. Worship is when we see what God is worth. And to recognise his worth in such a way as we begin to live in light of that, in such a way that it changes and transforms how we live. See, one of the things that this psalm makes clear is that we all worship something. For all of us in, in our lives, there is there is something that to which we have ascribed ultimate value. You see in verse 26, the Bible calls these things idols. It says, for all the gods of the nations are idols. Now, we all worship. Uh, we all ascribe ultimate value to something. And you know, fill in the blank. It might be your family, it might be your work. There's something for all of us that captures and, and engages our whole life. But if an idol is what we worship, if you serve them, if you live for them, if you try and find your hope and security in them, 
Well, this is a, a line from Sam Chan that we've seen in the, the ripple effect that we're doing. He says, whatever it is that is our idol, when we find them, they won't fulfill us. And when we fail them, they won't forgive us. But he says, when we find Jesus, Jesus will fulfill us. And when we fail Jesus, Jesus always forgives us. And friends, I think that's what this great psalm is pointing us to, that the Lord that we worship, the only one who will ultimately fulfill us is the Lord Jesus. Now Israel worship God here as they're gathered around the symbol of God's presence in the ark as it comes into Jerusalem. But we have had God's presence come to us in its fullness in the Lord Jesus. And so do we see his ultimate value? Worship is to see and ascribe to him his ultimate worth. And I think this is what is on display in our, in our gatherings. Not only do we declare his greatness, but as we come together each week, as our lives are changed and transformed as we follow him, then we ascribe to him the glory due his name. And as we do that, as we recognise his great worth, his ultimate worth, what it leads to is joy. You can't escape, you know, that's how the psalm ends. It's this great crescendo, isn't it? It's all of creation. The heavens rejoice, the sea resounds, the fields are jubilant, the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. And we join in, in verse 34, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. See what's going on here? It's this community of people gathered to give praise and thanks to God. It's a community who have understood his truth and his grace, a community who have ascribed to the Lord the glory due his name, who have recognised his ultimate worth, who have called on him as their saviour, a community changed in their thinking, transformed in their living and marked by thanksgiving. And as that community gathers, well, that is what an inquirer will see. And that is a powerful promotion of the gospel. Now, I was encouraged by the um, stats uh, that came through in the survey uh, that the vast majority in, of you indicated that you feel at least somewhat comfortable to invite friends along to our Sunday gatherings. And as we do that, as we take those opportunities to invite our friends, well, everyone who we invite along has some belief about God. And everyone has something to which they ascribe ultimate value in life. And our prayer is that as we invite our friends to come to our regular Sunday meetings like this, that like that appraiser on Antiques Roadshow, looking maybe for the first time at that item of great worth, we pray that by hearing the declaration, by seeing the worship and the joy, that they will see what we have come to see, that the one of ultimate worth is Jesus the Saviour. John Dixon gives an example as he concludes his chapter on this topic by just recalling how one woman, Emma, came to faith in Christ in this way said she was invited by a friend whose child was being baptised and she was so struck by the service and what she heard that uh, she came back the next week and the next and the next. And John Dixon says this, he says, the church services Emma went to were not pitched at atheists or non-church people in general. They were normal services of praise and encouragement. And that is my point. When we gather to declare the wonders of God, we are engaged in promoting God's glory to the world. And he says, to end the chapter where it began, he says, sing, sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. Let me pray for us as we uh, gather to do that each week. Our Father God, we do thank you for being able to gather together today as your people uh, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, but we thank you that we can do that every Sunday. 
And Lord, we thank you so much for our church family here at St. Aidan's. And we do pray that as we meet together each week, that our gatherings would declare and display your goodness and your grace toward us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.